Welcome on into another edition of Smith and Hessen and the cricket world is so busy at the moment so we've got so much to talk about in the next 30, 40 minutes or so. All intriguing stuff and very, very topical indeed. Joined in the studio by former White Fern and of course uh, current New Zealand selector uh, who's been very busy of late, Emily Drum. Welcome along Emily and uh, joining us live from uh, Bangalore, uh, Mike Hessen who's uh, set himself up for another long stint overseas. Yes, uh, good morning Indian time to you, good afternoon here. Uh, man, uh, first of all, let's start off with this uh, series, shall we, this, this intriguing first test match which has unfolded across the other side of India from where you are, but I'm sure right now you're uh, observing and feeling some of the ripplings and the fallout from India losing so badly. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, they're very passionate, obviously, about the cricket over here, so the fact that uh, India lost a test match at home against England uh, yeah, there's certainly plenty of ripples. There's probably more than that. And uh, they turned pretty quickly on a couple of senior batsmen in Pajara and Rahane, who it wasn't so long ago in Australia, they were the, uh, the heroes. So I think we know how fickle this game is. But uh, yeah, just down the road in Chennai, uh, obviously pretty hot. But I think from my point of view, I think the toss uh, is just so significant in these test matches over here and it sort of plays out accordingly. Emily, uh, you watched this test match. Uh, I'm sure you were gripped by it like uh, most of us were who watched it here on Sky. Uh, England on one heck of a roll at the moment. It's not very often that visiting sides go to the subcontinent and win three test matches in a row. Two convincingly in Sri Lanka and now the first one in India against the odds. So Joe Root and co uh, are playing a great form of the game at the moment. Well, isn't the captain just leading so superbly? And, and I think that's pretty much been the foundation that England have built their victories. And it's just so good to see a, a touring side go to the subcontinent and dominate. They haven't been uh, so great in the subcontinent for a long time, England, and they've certainly shown that they've got the goods in all facets of the game. Mike, to me, you look at Indian pitches, you mentioned it before, uh, you know them pretty well now, of course you've had to read them in, in various forms of the game, but uh, I look at turn, I look at bounce, I look at dust, I look at heat, I look at India winning most times. What went wrong? I mean, what, what was the factor? Was it, was it England being so damn good or India being lackadaisical, poor in their techniques? combination of a number of things and I mean sides come to New Zealand and they see a whole lot of grass on the wicket and they think that the toss is so important. For me the toss is so much more important than the subcontinent because you can get runs on the board and you can get ahead of the game and in many instances we've sort of been on the, the back end of that and when you get the benefit of winning the toss you've got to maximise it and England certainly did that and through Joe Root as Emily's alluded to I mean he was absolutely outstanding. He, he not only um, batted, they were able to bat for just over two days, but he was able to score at a rate that allowed them to get enough runs to dictate the test match. So you score at over three runs a, and over in India um, early on, you bat for that period of time, then you can dominate. And you could see the, the pitch deteriorate throughout, slowly throughout the first two days. And then as soon as England got the ball, they bowled around the wicket, even with the new ball, bashed it in halfway down the surface, and you could sort of see bits of puff, puffs of dust come up. You can see the footholds that the right-handers are trying to create from around the wicket. So Dom Best comes into the game. So all of it was incredibly well planned from an England point of view. So as I said, you've got to get ahead of the game first. And then once you do, you can't let the game drift. And I thought England, even in the first innings with the ball, as I said, they were all, all about trying to create the opportunity in the fourth innings. So really, really smart. Um, you know, they had the left, they had the left arm spinner and, and Leach. Um, and obviously they had Dom Best. So they had all their, their bases covered. And they had Jimmy Anderson with the old ball who just proved uh, um, an absolute masterstroke with that as well. He sure did, uh, Emily. I, I just want to get back to Joe Root just uh, briefly. What about the, the run of form that he's in at the moment? Double centuries, big hundreds, double century. Uh, and add to that, a perfect style of leadership, it seems, at the moment. He, he read that game perfectly. He went to the third day where a lot of, people, a lot of captains wouldn't. Uh, he, he, he didn't enforce the follow-on. He let his bowlers refresh and he let the pitch wear a wee bit more. Uh, and then, of course, people said, has he declared too late? And, of course, he won with a session to spare. Everything is falling into his lap. We, we questioned last time round whether he was back in the Fab Four. Coley, Williamson, Steve Smith. Is he back in the Fab Four? I think he's almost leading the band at the moment. Yeah, he certainly is. And he, he outplayed Coley this match, for sure. I think his leadership and, and 
confidence in his decision making has really rippled through the England side and certainly going into that third day is a little bit worried about that because it just doesn't normally happen. So for him to do that, the confidence that he backed his bowlers, he's got so many options to turn to. Ben Stokes was hardly even mentioned in the game. He's one mm. of the best all-rounders going in the game today. But I just thought probably the true mark for that test match that I will remember was his, his positioning when he took the, the catch of Pant and, and on the fifth day. Mm. Just a very unorthodox setting. Just set it up beautifully for that match and I thought that was the, the, the seal of, of, of the game for me. Yeah, look, look, everything's working well for them. They look like they've got a camp that's really well set up, Mike, and part of that camp, of course, is Jeet and Patel. Now, you know, you talked about Bess you, you, and you talked about Leach. Leach, in, in fact, was really hammered in the first part of that, that first innings. They talked to him, Pant in particular. Uh, so Jeet and Patel has worked very closely with these guys. This is not his first rodeo with them. Uh, but how influential is it having a spin bowling coach in India on the spot to address things right here and right now? Well, I think it's very important for a, for a coach who's actually been there as well, and he knows the pace you need to bowl. He knows that, you know, he... Jeetan Patel, whenever he was interviewed and, and talked about, he always talked about bowling a heavy ball over there. Mm. And with, with the ball, as you know, some skid on and some really prodigiously turn and bounce. And I thought Dom Best got better throughout the Test match. I thought in the first innings, he was, even though he got four wickets, I didn't think he was great. He bowled a number of full tosses, didn't quite have control. And then I thought you saw the Jeetan and bowling more heavier and harder into the wicket and actually letting the surface do the job. So... Um, look, I think it is great to have someone of his experience, um, and he knows those players well, having played on that county scene for so long. So I'm sure he would have had an influence. Right, that's the English side of it. They're 1-0 up. The next Test match starts in just a, f a matter of days. Uh, at the same venue, about three pitches across, which is unusual in itself, uh, Mike. Uh, what about India? Now, let's look at India. Let's look at your mate, Virat Kohli, who's, uh, you know, during the IPL, you're you cheek to cheek with, so to speak. Uh, what kind of pressure is he feeling? Because everyone talked about the fact that India seemed to play a more relaxed, enjoyable form of cricket when he left Australia because they didn't feel as if they were under so much pressure in the dressing room. I mean, that was the outside looking in. I'm not sure if that was the case or not. Uh, could it be the case? Are those murmurings still around? And why has the pressure gone on Rahani, who was a hero, as you say, a fortnight ago, eight days ago, he was a hero, and Pajara, who you just almost first pick in most conditions around the world? And then the, the asset has not gone on Coley. Oh, I think it's just such a fickle game. And, and I think that... Um you know, it, because often, um, you know, many countries, a lot of cricket supporters just look at the latest scorecard and they basically find a target. And I think the thing for me that showed some calmness was in the post-match interview is that, is that, you know, Virat Kohli's talking about the fact that Rahana and Pajara are massive players in their team and that hasn't changed in one game. And that's very, that's what you want to hear from your captain. That's what you want to hear from your coach, that, you know, they're not jumping at, at the, the one performance. And I think the reality is, India had to bat on, on day three and a half um, and day five. And they're the toughest times to bat. Um, even England struggled in the second innings, obviously. Um, but they're so far ahead of the game, they, they could look to try and push on. And, and even they struggled. So I think you, you really need to look at conditions. And, and I think that within the Indian setup, they will be calm enough to go, look, uh, we were outplayed. Um, we got behind the game. We, we weren't as consistent as we needed to be with the ball in that first innings. Um, because Indian sides, even if they do lose the toss, you would still think they'd be able to apply more pressure. I need to talk about it. Ishan Sharma, and he achieved a milestone in this Test match. Uh, he went past 300 wickets, joined the club of uh, Kapil Dev, the great legendary Kapil Dev, and Zahir Khan, the only two Indian seam or quick bowlers who have managed to pick up 300 wickets in the history of the game. Says a lot about quick bowlers uh, and how hard it is to bowl in India, and I wonder if you can really, at times, you look at their stats and maybe add 100 wickets on uh, and compare bowling in India to perhaps bowling in England and New Zealand and Australia uh, as much as they have not been able to do. Yeah, without doubt. I mean, the reality is, I mean, you saw it in this test match. If they get the new ball, they get it for two or three overs. Uh, most of their work's done with a soft old ball, um, and they don't get bounce generally. So, yeah, you're right. It's a completely different game. So when Ishan Sharma goes off <laughs> Indian shores and he gets to a wicket with a bit of bounce... I mean, he's well over six foot, probably closer to six four, six five. You know, he'd thrive on that type of bounce. And, and if he was to, to turn up in New Zealand and bowl every day, uh, you're right, I think 100 would be uh, too few. I think he would get even more than that because uh, he's a high-quality bowler. He can uh, he predominantly shapes the ball in, but he can get the ball to hold up, um, potentially go away a little bit, bowls a good leg cutter. 
Um, and he's, as I said, he's got that height and that control of length. Uh, two other great test matches. In fact, a lot of great cricket being played at the moment, uh, Emily. Of course, Pakistan, South Africa and Raul Pindi. Uh, it's, it's pretty hard to win in Pakistan and uh, in a test match where no side was able to achieve 300 in one innings. So it was a low-scoring affair. Pakistan, actually, I, I thought going into the last day, South Africa were hot favourites. If, if, if I was a betting man, I'd have thought I'd have put a dollar each way on, on uh, South Africa getting up there because uh, their run rate required, wickets in hand, was so much in their favour. And it was Hassan Ali with uh, a match analysis of 10 for 114. He ended up being man of the match. Uh, South Africa blew one there, I think. They absolutely did. They were in the box seat. And somehow they just either just got a bit too complacent, allowed the concentration just to drop a little bit, and, and all of a sudden the floodgates opened, and then it was a skittle uh, right through the end of their batting order. I was a bit disappointed because I really thought they were going to do it. And, and back on, on, on the um, coattails of India, having done it at the Gabba, and then all of a sudden the West Indies do it against uh, Bangladesh. So you're disappointed for South Africa. They would have thought they were in with a good shout there. A great battle between the wicketkeeper batsman in the series for me, Mike, because Mohammed Rizwan, who was absolutely outstanding in New Zealand, achieved his debut Test 100 in this uh, particular Test match. He's keeping well. Uh, he continues his emergence as a wicketkeeper batsman. On the other hand, you've got Quinton de Kock, who's captaining South Africa at the moment, who's formed with the batters dropped away. And I just wonder how long this post is going to be his. Yeah, and I think even he alluded to it um, before the Test Series that it was a bit too hard for him. Graham Smith mentioned it too, for him to do all three forms. Um, you know, to, he, he was quite happy doing the white ball and, and he looks like he's that type of character. Um, you know, he's, he's quite um, verbose and he, he, like he, um, he gets the group up and going. He's quite an aggressive player, so that white ball sort of stuff suits him. And the red ball, it's like he hasn't quite played the way that we know he can play and, and potentially the captaincy is weighed on him. Um, it's a, a really tough ask. I mean, Smithy, you know, keeping for mm. in that heat, um, trying to captain and bat at five, which he started. I see he's moved down to six. It's just too difficult, um, you know, to do your core job, let alone think about the captaincy side of things. So, um, yeah, delighted for Rizwan. Um, looking at the other side of that, I mean, he was very good in New Zealand, wasn't he? And and he was calm even when when Pakistan was struggling. So, I think he actually has an influence over the fact that. Um, you talk about Hassan Ali getting 10 wickets. I mean, he had a, he had a really poor first test, but they stuck with him. Um, they, you know, coming back after a long break, and that, that requires the captain to back his players. Um, and I think the fact that he, he backed Hassan Ali, he certainly got the rewards. And hopefully that 100 um, on the back of a very good tour of New Zealand with the bat personally uh, will see him continue to, to perform well because he, he, he was impressive, I thought. Barbara Azam, uh, captaining Pakistan, of course, wasn't prolific with the bat in this test match, but we know it's only a question of time for him. He's truly world class. But in his after-match speech, he thanked South Africa for coming. And I thought that, amongst everything, was quite uh, an interesting thing to say. Because, Emily, does that mean now the doors are now firmly open for Pakistan to host all sides from around the world? And will all sides go round, go to Pakistan? Would, would for instance, the Black Caps go in two weeks' time if they were, were to, uh, committed here. Would they go to Pakistan at the moment? Well, I'd like to think that South Africa, having gone there, has given them a little bit of confidence to say, hey, if they've done it, we can do it too. And safety is paramount. We have to make sure that everything is, mm. is well set up. Um, and hopefully this is the blueprint for making sure that other sides can travel safely and making sure they know they're going to get home safely too. So it's important for Pakistan as well to rebuild the faith in terms of teams coming there. And they want to play test matches and cricket at home against touring sides. That's what it's all about. They're probably sick and tired of travelling around the world. So good on them. And I hope that has given the whole cricketing world the confidence that Pakistan are back in business. So, Mike, you've been involved in this process before, obviously. How, how does it go about? You get an invitation to go from the Board of, of Cricket in Pakistan to New Zealand cricket. Uh, you say, we'd like you to tour here. I mean, it's got to be sanctioned by the ICC, all that sort of thing. They say yes. Then what is the process now, now that it's perceived perhaps that the doors are opening up? Well, there are a number of security firms um, around the world that are employed to, to do recce's. So basically New Zealand Cricket uh, and the Players Association um, and someone from a, the security firm will go um, over to Pakistan. They'll go and uh, talk to the appropriate people. They'll, they'll go to the venues. They'll get a security plan in terms of what's in place. Um, and then they'll basically have to, to decide the, the validity of it, the, the chance of, um, of it not working out. And, and just 
talk about it. You know, in terms of are we is the situation changed to a point where where we're comfortable to send our our team over? Obviously, our support staff. Um, are the hotels, are the ground, is the transport? I mean, there's so many different compartments to it in terms of that need to be signed off to say yes, we are comfortable that the risks are limited. I mean, I think touring any team in the world, there are always an element of risk. Um, but I mean, they they're, they're experienced. They employ people uh, to to make educated risks around those. So uh, then that comes back to New Zealand cricket, and then they make a decision over whether they're going to follow those um, that feedback from a security perspective or they'll get a second opinion, or they'll um, go to the board and ask for things to be changed. So, yeah, there is quite a process. Well, it's certainly food for thought, and uh, surely at, at some stage that question's going to be have to be answered by New Zealand cricket. The, the other test match, of course, was uh, West Indies against Bangladesh, uh, sorry, yeah, Bangladesh, who had dominated them, dominated them uh, in the 3-1 days, 3-0. So they hit, hit the ground running here, and they've get, given this really stiff run chase. I mean, no one these days gets 395 for seven. I mean, no one does in those conditions. And all of a sudden we find out there's a new name in West Indian cricket we haven't heard about. He's not a kid, he's 28, he's from Barbados, Kyle Mayers, 210 on debut, not out to win the test match on top of a 40 in the first innings. Uh, this for me is one of the most incredible innings. I've never been to Bangladesh, but I understand it's very, very hard with their spinners, etc. This is one of the most incredible innings in modern cricket for me on debut, surely. It's a fairy tale. It's just, a, it's so good for the game, for the West Indian game, for world cricket. It gives everyone hope that you can chase down a big total. It's just so important that these landmarks are, are achieved by these players because otherwise there's, there, there's, you know, we always strive to break records. We always strive to do something completely different in left field. The poor guy's hardly got 100 to, to speak of beyond this test match. He did come out here with the West Indian team in, in the T20s. He had a, a couple of goes, but certainly came from nowhere to be a hero overnight, which is fantastic for them and, and the game. What do you know about him, Mike? Well, I know he got a working over from Cole Jamison on the tour over here, um, struggled with the bounce. Um, but, yeah, I've seen him in the CPL. He's certainly got power. He's a, an all-rounder, bowls a bit of medium pace. You're right, he's certainly not at the start of his career um, in terms of his age. Um, I mean, they've, they've reeled out a number of guys around that age to, to try and find someone who can make it happen, but he's a very good player of spin, uh, and you can see that in the CPL. But yeah, day four and day five in Chittagong, it is searingly hot, it is dry, it is like it is It is a tough place to bat. Uh, to get 200 in the last innings of a test match, let alone get 395, to get 210 yourself at a, you know, over four and over, it's mm. just phenomenal. Uh, and his ball striking, like I said, on that wicket was just, it was incredible, and everybody else struggled. It wasn't like he, you know, he built a partnership with one other bloke and, and they made it look easy. He was the, he was the shining light. Um, it was, yeah, phenomenal. It's just, yeah, biggest of belief when you see the scorecard and you, and you watch some of it, um, just how well he played in, in those conditions on day five. Yeah, it just sort of demonstrates to me that uh, a lot of people wonder about the value of Test cricket and uh, the level of interest and excitement in Test cricket. I mean, what we're seeing in the last, uh, well, just this calendar year, in, fit, in fact, all around the world are results, 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 unlikely results as well. Uh, and you just don't know from one day to the next who's, who's going to be dominant in the series. And I think it's, it's been fantastic. On another note, uh, Emily Drum, the White Ferns, you've actually finally picked a team. Yes, we have. You have picked a team. <laughs> uh, just come out hot off the press. And it features two rookies, Brooke Halliday from the Northern Spirit. Fran Jonas, a teenager from Auckland. Tell us about these ladies. Well, it's very exciting for them to be given the opportunity. They've certainly deserved it. Brooke Halliday's been around for probably five, six years now and been a little bit inconsistent over the last four of those five years. And this year, she's really hit her straps, which is nice. Left-handed, bit of variety to the um, top of the order. And hopefully, in an attacking role, can bowl a little bit of Chris Harris, which is, is quite handy, just little stoppers. Um, and a very good fielder and a very good all-round cricketer, um, maturing really nicely into a good, complete player, which is what we need to put out on the park in terms of um, a one-day uh, player and, and the sort of person that we want to bring into the group. And Fran Jonas, still very, very young, but has played very consistently over the last two years. Still 
learning her craft. It's a tough gig, and I think getting her into the squad now, before the World Cup in a year's time, is the right thing to do, just to see how she can cope. I'm not sure if she's going to play all the games, but opportunity is there. We wanted to bring in, again, a, a, a variance, and she's left armour, um, and seeing how she goes against the, the English girls. Who are you looking to carry the weight or the runs of Susie Bates? Well, we do lean on uh, Sophie Devine a lot. Amy Satterthwaite's back uh, full-time, which is great. Um, so Brooke Halliday has been brought into that top order. Uh, we've had a couple of changes, so uh, Katie Perkins misses out. Um, and we've got Frankie Mackay back in the team. I know you guys will be very delighted about that. Um, you know, pure weight of runs eventually um, keeps knocking that door down, So, which, which is very exciting. Um, it, it's going to be a contribution. We've got Maddie Green um, back at the top of the order, mm. so hopefully she'll be able to uh, put a little bit of that big bash experience and, and certainly transform that into the one day. Uh, side of her game too. The Black Cats, they named their side very, very shortly, their squad to take on. Uh, I won't say a depleted Australian side, uh, but an Australian side lacking the very biggest names because, of course, they were committed to go to South Africa in the Test squad, which never eventuated either, so for one reason or another. One, were you surprised they didn't change that squad, Australia? Were you surprised? And two, what do you see um, eventuating uh, in terms of the Black Caps? Is there room for Finn Allen? Would you risk him against uh, an Australian side this early in the piece? Uh, is there room now for Colin Munro? Did he do enough? Is Martin Guptill under pressure? There are question marks, surely. Look, there are. I mean, I'll start with your first thing. From Australia's point of view, I guess with the quarantine issues um, and also the fact they've picked the squad already, um, they played relative, a lot of T20 cricket already in Australia, so they would have looked at enough at their own um, core players or their test players that are in there. So it is a chance for them to, to do what Emily said, I guess, and look at a slightly larger squad and then be able to narrow it down for the World Cup. So not really surprised they didn't make too many changes. I mean, it's a, it's a big bash 11, really. I mean, there's a lot of guys that perform very well in the big bash, um, some household names, which we can potentially talk about a little bit later. But, yeah, from a New Zealand point of view... Um, Look, once again, I'm not so sure about Colin Munro right now. I think he's played a lot of cricket. Uh, once again, you know what he can do. You can bring him in if you need to. Um, Finn Allen's the exciting one, isn't he? It's, it's a matter of, you know, whether you can fit him in there. Um, you know, often players need to have a breakout season like that just to get their first opportunity before you find out that they're actually really good. And New Zealand's uh, done that with Conway. Obviously, he's been knocking on the door for a long time. Uh, Will Young, as he's talked about, I think he's another fine player who sort of had to bide his time. Uh, but if we think back to when Martin Guptill made his debut, you know, it was on the, he was young, it was on the back of some really, really good domestic performances to a point where he needed that opportunity. Um, and Finn Allen, for me, I, I think there's no better time to do it. I mean, he's been exceptional at the top of the order. Um, you know, once again, it's who you're going to leave out. Obviously, Tim Seifert's performed very well. Martin Guptill's had that hamstring strain. I'm not sure about his fitness. Um, but if he's not fully fit, personally, I would use the opportunity to bring in Finn Allen rather than Munro at the moment, who you could potentially bring in later. Oh, well, I wouldn't, personally. Not against the old enemy. Uh, even a depleted old enemy, I, I simply would not put him back in there. But However, we'll uh, see. That's not too far away. And uh, has he been that good? We shall wait and see. But... Um, the other big question for you, Mike Hess, and the reason you're actually in India right here and now is the IPL. Uh, of course, we know where you are. You're in Bangalore, which means you're involved with the Royal Challengers Bangalore. Uh, where are you at in terms of timing? Uh, what we're reading in the papers over here or uh, on stuff, etc., is players that have been left out or not required or not available. So when are we actually going to find out who's actually playing in this tournament and where you're playing it? Well, where we're playing it, I think, will be decided later, uh, post-auction. So, um, you know, the two options are, are India or uh, back to the UAE. So those options are both on the table, uh, and we'll have to plan for both. So um, the auction is on the 18th of this month. Any chance uh, you've quizzed uh, Emily on, uh, on whether Frankie Mackay should be selected? Is there just any sniff of uh, some black cap involvement, any new black cap involvement? Fairly tall, blonde guy that's oh, made a bit of an impression. Van Allen? <laughs> I'd be very surprised if Kyle Jamison doesn't have interest, uh, without doubt. I mean, there's obviously three um, coaches from New Zealand um, who are involved, or, and, and Shane Bond. So there's four teams that obviously, um, you know, get, get Sky Sport and, um, and watch cricket in New Zealand. So, um, 
you know, he's he'd certainly be on the radar. There's no doubt about that. OK, Mike, thanks very much uh, for your time. I know uh, you've got plenty on your plate uh, in the next week or so. We'll, we'll leave you and catch up with you next week. Uh, it's been great to catch up, of course, even though you're not thanks in the studio come. with us. Emily, again, thanks very much for coming in. And your views on, on the white ferns, very, very interesting indeed uh, with what's coming up. That's it for this edition of uh, Smith & Hesson. Man, some great test matches. Can India fight back? Can they turn it around in such a sh short space of time? And would you like to be in Virat Kohli's shoes at the moment? I'm not sure I would. I, I kind of feel that he's under a bit of siege himself. So, uh, look, enjoy the cricket in the next week and uh, we'll come back with uh, our thoughts and opinions uh, in another edition of Smith & Hesson very shortly. Thanks very much for watching.